I don't believe we're at a point right now where consumers are expecting this as table stakes for any lawyer that they deal with. But the lawyers that are offering these cloud-based technologies um, and client-centered technologies, I I would also talk about as a category, are massively differentiating themselves in the market. And consumers are gravitating towards those, those lawyers. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Answering Legal's Everything Except the Law podcast. I am your host, Nick Worker. If this is your first time tuning in, this is the podcast where we share expert advice on all the parts of running a law firm that attorneys weren't exactly trained for back in law school. Uh, We have another really exciting episode for you all today as we are joined by the CEO and founder of Clio, Jack Newton. Uh, I'm going to be talking with Jack about the 2020 Clio Legal Trends Report, which everyone in the industry would be wise to check out. We'll also be getting to know the Clio company a little better along the way. Uh, now, before I begin, uh, I should note that you may hear some slight audio issues on my end of the conversation at the beginning of the video, but I promise you'll be able to hear Jack perfectly and the audio gets better as you uh, get through the video. Uh, without further ado, here's my conversation with Jack. Uh, so for anybody who isn't really familiar with you, can you introduce yourself, give us a brief overview of Clio and... and uh, Anything else you want to add in introductory? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, So I'm the founder and CEO of Clio. Uh, Started Clio 12 years ago, back in 2008. Uh, And and at that point, Clio was the first cloud-based practice management system in the world. And back then, we, we spent the first half of explaining what Clio was to someone, explaining what the, what the cloud was and what this, this foreign idea of storing your, your data uh, and accessing your data in the cloud looked like. So uh, early pioneer in cloud computing have really spent you know, a, a bunch of the last 12 years uh, educating uh, the, the legal space about cloud computing, about some of the security and ethics considerations that are related to to cloud computing, particularly as it relates to lawyers' use of cloud computing. And over the last few years, especially, we've been uh, both at Clio and and for myself personally, really developing ideas around how cloud computing can be used to transform client experiences and, and how you can use and leverage the cloud, not just to make your law office more productive and more efficient, but to actually deliver legal services to clients in a completely new way to deliver value add and value proposition, you know, in, in a completely new way and, and to really redefine the, the, the client experience from a, from a foundational standpoint. Uh, and uh, about a, a year ago, I published a, a book on this topic called the the client-centered law firm, and I've I've been spending a, a lot of time recently uh, talking about that. So that 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 that's me in a, a nutshell. Um, interestingly, some some people uh, don't know I, I came from a technical background, so I've got a, a master's degree in computer science. That's where I've received most of my training, and have have really found this intersection of technology and legal to be to be super interesting and a great opportunity to apply some of the ideas from technology companies, from product management to the, uh, to the legal sector. I still remember uh, like the first time I had come across Clio when I first started working here and, and we opened up like seven years ago. So I think you guys are a few years older than us. And I remember looking at the website and being like, oh, this guy, Jack Newton, he's, you know, he's got a background in computer science and he's building this thing. And, and uh, it, it didn't seem like such a necessity back in the day to really run your law firm out of the cloud, you know? And uh, like I didn't talk to many people who were very concerned with, um, you know, I send messages. That's my big thing, right? Like I'll right. do a legal intake and I send messages to uh, the lawyers and the law firms who are my clients. And it was never really important for us to be able to push messages into someone's system. It was like, oh, you can send it to me on my phone. Uh, you can send it to my secretary, um, you know, in an email, that's fine. And now it's like, well, I need that thing published, not only in my CRM, but I need you to schedule a, a consultation in my calendar that syncs with my phone. And you know, this person has to have access to it. 
And uh, it's become more efficient in that way, but it's crazy to see the like the explosiveness of the growth of just using cloud solutions in law firms, which is a good thing. Um, yeah. And I do want to talk 100%. about your book. I, I want to talk about your book. I'm sorry to cut you off. Uh, usually I read the book of the guest that's coming on. I have to read your book, but I have read a bunch of uh, like transcripts of talks that you've had about the book. Um, and I do want to, I want to cover this is so obviously 2020 is just like, I don't even have a word. It's just, it is what it is. Um, so do you feel that even though there was this, you know, this sort of growth over the last five years or, or decade or so of, of lawyers and law firms using cloud solutions, do you feel that a lot of the legal world was largely unprepared to do business uh, sort of with the circumstances that are, that are going on? Yeah, it's great, great question. And I, I, I think what we, we've seen over, in, in my time in, in the legal industry over the last 12 years, uh, just like every type of technology adoption, we see this, this diffusion curve where there's plenty of early adopters, uh, some early majority that were starting to get the cloud, starting to understand its value proposition. But it was a pretty, a, a pretty slow boil. You know, people were adopting the cloud, but like you said, even five years ago, uh, having your, your law practice in the cloud, so to speak, wasn't considered table stakes. It's something that forward-looking law firms were, were doing. And, and what I think we've seen in the last eight months with, with COVID-19 is this really punctuated event where all of a sudden it's table stakes to be in the cloud and the law firms that were able to either leverage the fact that they're already in the cloud or get into the cloud quickly were the ones that were able to adapt most rapidly to the new environment that we were we were operating in. And I think the legal industry is a really interesting uh, industry industry with a ton of opportunity to to evolve because it in a lot of ways I think is the last major industry to be fundamentally transformed by technology but more specifically the last major industry to be fundamentally transformed by the internet. When you, you think about how most lawyers were doing business in January of 2020, it was fundamentally at least similar to the way they were doing business in 2010, the year 2000, the year 1990, maybe even the year 1980. You know, like we, we've seen a relatively long period of stasis almost in, in the way that lawyers were delivering legal services. And I, I think about the, the COVID-19 event in, in almost evolutionary biology terms is, is one of the ways I like thinking about it. And Stephen Jay Gold uh, introduced this concept uh, around punctuated equilibria and this idea that, that species don't evolve in, in a really slow, progressive manner over time, uh, but instead they, they actually evolve in very rapid, in a very rapid fashion in a fairly compressed amount of time, at least on a geological scale, when there's some major stressor or external event that, that forces that, that, that species to evolve, or at least forces some level of speciation where you see new versions of the species emerging that are better adapted to this new environment. And I, I think at the end of the day, COVID-19 is one of these events that's driving a new punctuated equilibrium for the legal industry where we're seeing some law firms understand what this new landscape looks like, what delivering legal services in this new landscape looks like, how they can leverage the internet uh, to, to deliver legal services in new ways, how they can collaborate in the cloud with their coworkers and colleagues to, to, to get work done. These are the newly and higher evolved lawyers that, that are able to deliver legal services in a way that uh, similarly, consumers have gone through this rapid phase of change over the course of the last eight months and have completely different sets of expectations of all of their service providers and all of their, uh, all of the people that provide them goods and services more broadly have, have changed dramatically over the eight months and over the last eight months. And there's an enormous opportunity for lawyers to dial into 
uh, this this new landscape and ad adapt. And you know, as as, as Darwin stated, it's it's not the the strongest or, or biggest of a species that 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 thrives. It's the one that's most adaptable to change. And I, I think really what we've seen COVID-19 highlight for us is that lawyers were in a position already where they needed to evolve to unlock the huge market opportunity that exists for, uh, for lawyers that, that can tap into that market opportunity. And with COVID-19, we've seen 10 years or more of that evolution and that change compressed into just a few months. And, you know, like, like any major seismic change, there's going to be some law firms and some lawyers that emerge from this crisis stronger and better positioned to win. And there's going to be others that emerge uh, weaker and, or, or maybe even having failed outright. Uh, and those will be the lawyers that, that can't adapt. And I, I believe really strongly what underlies uh, the, the law firms that will be succeeding and thriving in this new environment is two things. One is embracing technology and really embracing in particular uh, being cloud-based. Uh, and, and the second is being client-centered and, and really thinking from the ground up, how do you deliver your legal services in a way that are, are, are client-centered? And those, those two pieces play off of each other really nicely. Being cloud-based allows you to be client-centered in some really innovative and, and cool ways. I, I was so taken in when you were talking about, um, I think it was uh, Stephen Gold or something like that. Where yeah, Stephen Jay Gold uh, yeah, Stephen and, Gold. and his punctuated equilibrium concept. It's, it's really interesting. It, it's really interesting because, I mean, why would, why would a species have to evolve if there wasn't some sort of stimuli forcing them to evolve. Like we didn't just, we didn't evolve just to evolve. We evolved obviously for a need. Um, right. And, uh, and so I think that's a cool concept to apply to this, right? Is because there's clearly a need right now. This is the stimuli, what we're going through. And, and it's kind of corny to phrase it in this way, but I was doing, um, I was doing a webinar with a guy, Andy Stickle of Social Firestarter. I love this guy. He is, He's like, like a guru, honestly. He's like a genius at, at marketing himself and for his clients too. And we were, we had this webinar and we're talking about, you know, like the pandemic sucks. This is going to suck for a lot of people, but this is an opportunity. That sounds corny, right? To get on there and be like, oh, like this crazy bad thing that's happening is an opportunity for us to get really caught up. And uh, I think for the, for, for law firms that were lagging behind, I'm interested to hear what, what, you sort of have to say about this, but I wonder how many law firms were like, okay, well, I can't meet with my clients in person and, you know, I can't, I don't, I don't have a printer at home. I don't have a, back, I don't have that giant Xerox thing anymore. Um, so I need to make a change for my, my office or I'm going to, I'm going to go extinct, you know, like in the same analogy or metaphor, metaphor, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and uh, I won't, like how many law firms or, or what was your uh, sort of experience when, when this went on? Like how many, how many law firms really came to Clio in addition to what you normally see and said, I, I need to make a change right now? Yeah, great, great question. And, you know, just to, to, to comment on, on your observation too about the, you know, maybe the backdrop that we're talking about this opportunity existing in, I, I think is, a really fair point, you know, and I, I, I want to be clear when I'm, I'm talking about the, the opportunity that, that COVID-19 presents, you know, we need to acknowledge there's a, a backdrop of both a, a huge humanitarian toll this crisis has exacted with you know, over a quarter million people dead in the, the United States alone already, uh, and, and numbers that are trending in the wrong direction in virtually every, every jurisdiction in the world. Um, and uh, you know, the, the economic crisis that is accompanying that, that humanitarian toll as well um, isn't something we, we can ignore, but it's, it's actually one of the inputs for honing in on the, the opportunity that exists for, for lawyers in this crisis. And I, I, I look to a few data points that, uh, that really highlight that opportunity. One is the, the World Justice Project that tells us that 77% of consumers that had a legal issue did not see that 
legal issue resolved by a lawyer. And those are pre-pandemic numbers. So we have a huge access to justice problem in the sense that the, the vast majority of people that have a legal problem do not see that, that legal problem resolved by a lawyer. And again, pre-pandemic, we saw over 30% of Americans that said they would be unable to pay for an unexpected $400 expense at any given point. And, and again, that's the that, that's larger than a larger cost than most legal matters. Um, so we, we have a, a, a huge access to justice problem that is only being exacerbated by this by this crisis. The, those numbers are only trending in the wrong direction and consumers ability to pay will be even less than it was in the past. But at the same time, we've got this building tsunami of legal demand that, that, that I believe is forming where we have a whole raft of legal issues that have not been tackled, have not been pursued over the course of, of COVID-19 due to both consumer perception that law firms are closed and not operating, which is a data point we saw in the legal trends report, a really surprising data point with upwards of 30% of consumers indicating that they thought lawyers were essentially not essential services and weren't available during the pandemic. Um, I think they're you know, potentially incorrectly extrapolating from news about court closures and so on to believe that, that lawyers aren't, aren't working. So that, that's one factor building into this, this backlog of demand. And then we, we've, on top of that, that backlog of demand, got an entirely new level of COVID-19 related legal issues, whether these are eviction and landlord and tenant related issues or employment issues or workplace safety issues, you name it, there, there's gonna be uh, an entire class of legal issues related specifically to COVID-19. So all of this, th this crisis is catalyzing, uh, like I said, this, this oncoming tsunami of legal issues coupled with a populace that is less able to pay for those legal issues than, than ever. And again, this, this isn't a reason to, to throw in the towel and say there's no way to service this demand. This is, this is actually an opportunity. This is a, a product market fit problem in, in, in startup and product uh, terms and a, a gigantic opportunity to rethink how are we pricing and packaging our legal services? Are there ways that we can offer our legal services, for example, on a subscription basis or on a fixed fee basis that is better calibrated to the needs of the, uh, the legal consumer. So, you know, I, I go back to Winston Churchill and, and his statement that, you know, never let a, a, a good crisis go to waste. And that, that's kind of how I see COVID-19 is, is, you know, without dismissing the enormous uh, cost in a lot of places, this is catalyzing, I believe, a long overdue change in how lawyers think about delivering legal services and, and provides an enormous platform for innovation and experimentation. And, and the reason I am especially excited about the opportunity this presents for, uh, for lawyers and, and le the legal space overall is that we're being given permission in a way that we've never really had permission to experiment by, by consumers. Where they eight months ago, nine months ago, might've expected to come into your law office and be impressed by your marble floor and mahogany desk uh, in, your, in your lobby, they, they don't expect that anymore. They, they're just as happy to jump on a Zoom call with you to talk about their legal issue. And in fact, they vastly prefer to jump on a, a Zoom call with you rather than having to uh, travel to, to your law office. And, and I think what is so important for us to recognize and for forward thinking lawyers to recognize is this, this punctuated evolution and this punctuated equilibrium that we're, we're entering to, to again reference Stephen Jay Gold's concepts. This is not a, a temporary change. This is, this is not a transitory thing that will revert to normal uh, when we're on the other side of this pandemic. What, what we're observing is a permanent shift in consumer expectations, a permanent shift in how lawyers can interact with consumers and work with consumers online. And it's gonna stay that way post pandemic. We're gonna see many law firms realize that maybe they don't need their bricks and mortar law office in the way that they, they thought they did. We'll see many lawyers realize maybe they don't need to be 
based in an urban area like uh, like their clients are. They could actually effectively deliver their legal services to their uh, to their urban clients from a rural location potentially. They can start to eliminate massive sources of overhead and cost structure from uh, from their legal services and potentially deliver them in a more affordable and accessible way to this to this enormous market demand that exists. Uh, so all of that is to say there, there's an enormous opportunity and for for lawyers that think innovatively about how to tap into that opportunity, uh, it it is a, a virtually unbounded opportunity right now. I'm gonna I'm gonna give some free advertising to a good friend of mine. Um, over at LawPay, I was my the latest episode that just came out. There's another one in between. It takes a while to edit. You know how it is. Um, but we were talking about LawPay is going to start offering um, like their own financing for clients. And so we're talking about how a lot. I, I forget what the number is, but I I had read that too. And like a consumer study is like the majority of people can't afford a four hundred or five hundred dollar unexpected expense in a month. Um, and so the, ac the accessibility of legal services for a lot of people is, is a huge problem. And I deal with this because I have customers who will talk to me and say, you know, like I get tons of leads, but none of these people can afford my services. Um, and that's especially true of like criminal defense, um, family, uh, sometimes bankruptcy, um, obviously. And, uh, and so we're sort of seeing that now companies like us are offering these solutions that make legal services more accessible, right? And so the other thing that, that you were saying, and, and this is why I love the Clio Trends Report, is at the start of the pandemic, you know, lawyers are like, how am I going to get new clients? This, that, the third. And, and, and we're, we're all talking about, like, let them know you're still open. You know, like put out a blog post that says my, my office is still open. If you just want advice, call me, go on social media, do, do something, post a, post something on LinkedIn, anything, right? Let them know you're still open. And it sounded so dumb, right? Yeah. I, I probably sounded like an idiot going on a video and telling a thousand lawyers we're, we're live on this webinar. You have to let people know you're still open. And, and how many did you say? In the, in the Clio trends? Yeah, it's, it's, it's 30 plus percent uh, over the course of the, the pandemic were, were indicating that they believed lawyers had stopped offering their services. So, you know, as, as bizarre as, as that sounds, your, your, your recommendation was entirely on point. If, if you're thinking about what's the single biggest thing you could do almost as a public service announcement kind of, kind of effort, it's, it's, and I, I, I gave this recommendation, by the way, also when I was uh, doing uh, one of my COVID-19 briefings to bar association leaders and uh, to, to the ABA and so on is part of the service that bar associations could be giving to their membership is that level of advertising. Like simply uh, we're open for business message for, for law firms, both at an institutional level and an individual law firm level and an individual lawyer level, I think is, uh, as you mentioned, as counterintuitive as, as it sounds, something that's actually, actually necessary, and that you can be uh, pursuing many legal issues right now, uh, even if the courts are, are slowed down or, or some are even closed, uh, there, there's still many avenues to, uh, to pursue. So that's an important message. Yeah, and, and I think what we're really getting at here is you know, we've seen such a rapid shift in the way that people consume, and especially the way that they're consuming legal services, right? That's what we're focused on, obviously. Um, and so in order to sort of capture a market share, you have to meet the consumer where they are. Yeah. So these, these, new, these new people who, who are looking to hire lawyers no longer want to just come into your office sign some paperwork and then never hear from you again until their case is over. You know, they want to be catered to and they want to be involved. And, and we're, and so we're seeing this and that's why Clio is so cool, right? Is because you have the portal, you can communicate with your lawyer, you have a secure place where, where you, that's your information, you know, things are sensitive nowadays. You want to make sure it's secure. Right. Um, and, uh, and 
companies like LawPay saw the need that, that people couldn't afford legal services, so they offered financing. Now, that doesn't solve the problem of why people can't afford things, but we're not, we're not really in that, in that sector. Um, we're, not, we're not humanitarians like that, unfortunately. Um, I, I want to get this right. So from this year's trends report, uh, it was noted that firms that offered client portals specifically in 2019 collected 16000 plus dollars more per lawyer that's in the firm, I'm assuming. Uh, so are we getting to the point now where most legal consumers just expect to be able to share information online with their lawyer in that way? So yeah, uh, a few things. Number one, that that data point, uh, not sixteen thousand dollars per lawyer, was for twenty nineteen, and we actually saw that accelerate through twenty twenty, uh, and they're expected to collect twenty three thousand uh, more dollars in twenty twenty than than uh, their peers who are not using client portals. So m maybe popping up a level, just just talking about the overall consumer expectations on, on technology. I don't believe we're at a point right now where consumers are expecting this as table stakes for any lawyer that they deal with, but the lawyers that are offering these cloud-based technologies um, and client-centered technologies, I would, I would also talk about as a category, are massively differentiating themselves in the market and consumers are gravitating towards those those lawyers so don't think of this as a, a catch-up game where where you're trying to catch up to what the majority is already doing it is still a relatively small fraction of lawyers that very innovative forward-thinking lawyers that are offering these kinds of services client portals even, even what you might regard as, as table stake stuff, like accepting credit cards, uh, you know, a, a large uh, portion of law firms do not st still to this day offer credit cards as a payment form, despite the fact that as we've seen in the legal trends report year after year, there's a strong consumer preference for paying by, by credit card. Uh, we, we also saw, in addition to offering client portals, um, we saw lawyers that were able to offer electronic payments to their clients drive uh, $15,000 of incremental revenue from uh, compared to their peers who were not offering uh, electronic payments. And finally, uh, firms that were using online uh, intake and CRM software saw uh, $27,000 more revenue per lawyer in 2020 or projected to see that amount more in 2020 than uh, their peers who are, are not. So we're, we're number one seeing in aggregate, and, and by the way, these, the, these gains all compound on, on one another and, and this concept of aggregation of marginal gains is, is one I'd love to, to spend a minute on if we have time, but we'll, we'll put a bookmark in that, but just coming back to these, these financial impacts, they're, they're huge and they, they compound on one another. So you see law firms that are embracing all three of these technologies, client portals, electronic payments, and CRM and online intake. They're outperforming their peers who are not using these technologies by more than 40%. And it's just a, if I said there's a way, there's very straightforward things that you could implement in your law firm to to drive a 40% revenue result, you, you'd, you'd fall over yourself, you know, to find out what those things are. And, and that's exactly what it is. It, it's, it's all straightforward, easy to implement stuff. And the putting this back in client centered terms, the, the great thing is that these technologies all talk to the modern consumer and all interact with the modern consumer in the way that they prefer to be interacted with. So, Let's look at the uh, online intake as an example. When you go to most law firm websites, the number one call to action on that website is phone us. Call us at this 800 number. And that's actually the exact opposite of what most consumers that are on your website want to do. It's, it, and, and the technical term for it is channel switching. But when you ask a consumer to switch from one form to another, you know, there's, there's this issue that, that you know, they, they don't necessarily want to start off with a phone call. They maybe want to talk to you down the road, 
but they maybe want to have like a quick online chat with you to start with, or they maybe want to submit their case details to you via an online intake form. And when you're speaking the consumer's language in that way, and you know they're online and they want to interact with you online, that's the, that's the right place to, to start. And then escalate to the phone call when that's the right part of the, of the engagement. This, the, the second piece I'll comment on is on the electronic payments piece. So many law firms still rep- require clients to pay by check. And, and what we saw again is when the pandemic hit, the law firms that really depended on checks as a form of payment hit a brick wall when it came to cash flow. And the law firms that were accepting electronic payments didn't miss a beat. And again, we actually saw them accelerate their business because they were more adaptable to this new environment. And clients started strongly preferring uh, law firms that, that could uh, accept electronic payments. Uh, and, and, and lastly, this, this client portal piece, you're 100% right. When, when you're dealing in an online world, when you're working with clients in an online world, their number one concern is security. And everyone has concerns about private documents flying back and forth via email, who, who might else have access to that email account in a, in a home environment, for example. So thinking about how do you create a secure communication channel that is convenient for your clients to work with is paramount to lawyers as well. And uh, we, we've, we've been able to offer that with, with uh, the Clio Connect client portal. And something we announced at ClioCon last month that we we're actually super excited to announce was this Clio for clients app that is bringing that, that secure experience to a mobile app where you can, you can directly interface with your, um, with your clients in a secure, convenient, easy to use app while they're on the go or while you're on the go. And, and it helps, help, helps you be responsive. And the, maybe the last data point I'll, I'll call out from the legal trends report uh, is one of the number one things we see consumers indicating that they prioritize in a lawyer is responsiveness. When they phone you, they want you to pick up the phone. When they text you, they want to text back right away. When they email you, they want a response right away. And again, you know, for, for lawyers, this doesn't necessarily always mean, it, this doesn't imply it's always them being responsive. It's about how do you set up your technology so your firm is responsive to your client's needs without you necessarily being individually available. And by the way, when you look at the stack ranked list of what consumers care about, what is at the bottom of that list is the fact that you have a physical office for them to visit. They, they don't actually care about this bricks and mortar office that you, you might be inhabiting. They don't care about your fancy lobby. They don't even care about the, care about the fact that you graduated uh, Megan Cum Laude in your law school. They, they, they care about the fact that you are responsive to their needs and that you can solve their problems. I've just seen a lot of switch from the way that even consumers pick lawyers, right? Is, is the availability and sort of the, the multitude of, of services that, that they offer, right? So like the more that you can offer a client, the more that they can choose from. And, and you sort of end up meeting these consumers where they are. Um, and, and I think it's always been hard for, for lawyers to understand what their consumers want, right? Is because there hasn't really been in the last 12 years or before that, there hasn't really been a report sort of like your report that really tells law firms what their consumers want. Um, I'm pretty sure yeah. I'm right about that because I have looked, honestly, for... Uh, yeah, no, you're, you're right. It's, it's really a, a one-of-a-kind report. And when we, we first published the Legal Trends Report, uh, this is our, our fifth year publishing the report, and we started off really focusing on law firm key performance indicators and, and, and productivity metrics. And, you know, as the report's grown uh, over, over time, we, we really wanted to start exploring this, this chasm that we, through our own experience and, and through my personal experience in, in working with, with, with law firms and consumers alike, really starting to understand this, this chasm that existed between consumer expectations and lawyers' understandings of what, what, what those expectations were. And for, for lawyers to truly unlock the market opportunity that's out there, and, and again, to tap into that, 
77% of the legal market that is wide open for the taking. It's all about understanding the consumers that are in that space and what their, what their preferences are. Especially if you look at the very rapidly evolving preferences that exist among millennial consumers. And this is already the largest purchasing generation on the planet. And, and I believe their preferences and needs are actually really well reflected uh, or were early indicators of what we're seeing uh, more and more generations demanding from their legal service providers and ser service providers of all types, thanks to, thanks to COVID. And, and those preferences are really all orbiting around effortless experiences, online experiences, and responsive experiences. And, and that's what consumers pay, care about these days. And the lawyers that can figure out ways of delivering that, and again, I, I believe that it's pretty straightforward. It's embracing being cloud-based and it's embracing being client-centered. If you can do that really effectively, you're gonna stand apart and you're gonna be massively differentiated from the majority of your peers that are stuck in this pre-COVID way of thinking about legal services and of how they deliver legal services. I, and I love talking about this and I love talking about like the evolution, right? And, uh, and one of the things that, that I was always taught and really heard uh, over the last few years is um, when the pain gets great enough, that's, that's when you'll make the change, right? Right. And so right now, as unfortunate as it is for a lot of law firms, or, or at least a few months ago, uh, a lot of law firms were in this sort of pain, right? They weren't bringing on new clients. They were shutting down. They were trying to downsize, cut costs, cut expenses. And, um, and that's when we saw them really make a change. And I spoke with one of my favorite people, uh, Robert Gruler, who does a lot of uh, video marketing. I'm sure you're, you're familiar with him. I actually think he uses Clio. Um, and we were talking about how, you know, he creates like 50 to 60 videos a month. And he has this masterclass where he teaches other lawyers to make video. And we're like, what else are you doing right now? You're not busy. And if you are busy, good. Do whatever you're doing to stay busy, right? Right. But you have all this time, you know? And, and don't just sit around and mope and say, why me? Poor me. You can really go out there and, and, and say some things on a video. And I've seen, because I like to spend a lot of time on LinkedIn for very obvious reasons. I always say that. Um, and uh, recently I've seen so many people just clearly with their iPhone making and an iPhone makes a good video. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not criticizing here, but they're clearly like somebody's got their iPhone out and they're explaining like this part of a case or, or case law so that their potential customers can understand what they're going to go through. And I'm like, wow, that is, that is the change we're looking for. Right. And, and nobody want, you know, especially the, you know, the millennials, right? We're not, we're not reading blog posts anymore. You know, uh, as I said, as I am to say it, it's like content is king, but there are different forms of content and, yeah. and, and video content being one of them. Um, so I just, I've seen so many things shift and, and that's from my perspective, obviously. Um, and I, I, I keep, I feel like I keep going back to the, the Clio legal trends report, but it's, I, I was just reading it for so long. It's, it's a pretty big report. Um, and yeah, I want to ask you, especially. <laughs> yeah. And so I have it like bookmarked on my computer cause I go through sections of it. Um, but from your perspective, and, and I think this will be really interesting cause, cause you're you, um, what was the most surprising thing that you learned in gathering results for this year's report? Yeah. Um, Man, as you commented on, this year's legal trends report was uh, a monster. And, you know, I, I, I think maybe one of the most surprising results for me was a bit of a shift in, in terms of the past reports we've published. Uh, we've often talked about the fact that there's this, this chasm between consumer expectations and how lawyers were delivering legal services. And, and this year's report for the first time ever really, I think highlighted the fact that we're actually seeing 
a shift that is helping drive lawyers and consumers closer together rather than further apart. And that, that's kind of a macro, a macro level take on the report. But one of the overall uh, messages that the constellations of, of data in the report tell us is that you know, COVID-19 has pushed consumers to a more online world. They're consuming, buying, goods and services primarily online and their desire for uh, consuming services from, from, uh, from legal providers that offer their services online has gone through the, the roof. And then when we look at the, the data from the lawyer's side, when I look at this data, um, one of the ways I, I frame this is is, is thinking about the legal trends report data for lawyers adoption of technology to me it looks like it's a, a report from the distant future like you know if, if you if you handed me the data that we were looking at in this year's legal trends report back in january of this year i, I would have told you that that you know this data must be from the year 2030 or so like i i, I really believe we've seen a decade or more of transformation and technology adoption uh, in lawyers and law firms. And you just look at the data where you look at the adoption rate of cloud solutions. You look at the adoption rate of Zoom and video conferencing tools. You look at the, uh, the amount of facility that we see lawyers demonstrating when it comes to all of these online technologies, electronic payments, Zoom calls, you name it. It, it it's, it's really a punctuated difference from what we saw in February or January of this year. So this, this I think has really helped push, you know, through an external force and back to our original kind of conversation around the kind of like evolutionary biology take on this, this, this the macro environment that COVID-19 has impo imposed on both consumers and lawyers has really done a lot to push them closer together than they were pre-pandemic. It's equipped consumers with the tools and technologies and mindsets where they're more comfortable working with, with lawyers online. And we've seen law firms adapt to operating online. And again, you know, it, those are gonna be, the, it's not every law firm, but those are gonna be the law firms. And again, the, the message, the signal that comes through very strongly in the data from this year's Legal Trends Report is the law firms that are making that shift and embracing those cloud-based tools and embracing those client-centered tools are winning in a really definitive way. And those, those dividends are gonna continue to pay off over the next decade because this is a permanent shift in consumer expectations and a permanent shift in terms of how they want to access legal services. So for me, that's the, the number one takeaway from this year's Legal Trends Report. And, um, and, and, and the most surprising result, the fact that we are, you know, for the first time in, in five years of doing this report, really starting to see an opportunity for consumers and lawyers to be a better fit going forward, thanks to some of the macro level changes that, that COVID-19 has driven. Yeah, I, I, so I got it wrong before, obviously, but it was kind of cool that I got it wrong because, uh, you know, we sort of compared 2019 to 2020 in this way, um, is that I said, uh, is it true that in, in 2019, uh, firms that offered client portals collected 16,000 plus more per lawyer? And you're like, no, that was, that was 2019. In 2020, it was 23,000 plus. And that just shows me that there's still potential for growth, um, which is sort of crazy to think about that it took us staying at home <laughs> to, right. to sort of draw closer together in that regard. Um, and, and I didn't get to read this yet and I really want to read this. So I'm probably going to be way more knowledgeable on this in the future, but uh, you wrote this book, the client centered law firm. Um, so you wrote this book pre pandemic. Am I right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, I know it's obviously the client centered law firm. So it was probably pretty spot on for the pandemic, but so what are some of the specific lessons 
from the book that you feel are particularly relevant right now? Yeah. So what, what's kind of interesting about the book is I actually think it's, it's more relevant, uh, today than it was even pre pandemic, because the, the, the message of the book is basically so much of the way legal services are delivered and the way they're priced and packaged today uh, is a function of the way they've been priced and packaged for generations now. And, and, and overall, it's in a way that is very lawyer centric. And, and even if you look at something as, as foundational to legal as the billable hour, you know, I'd argue that's actually a construct that is very, very lawyer centered. But, uh, you know, as, as Seth Godin put it at ClioCon, no client ever woke up with a billable hour problem that needs solved. You know, they, they woke up with a problem that needs solved by a lawyer that, that can help them solve it. And it's really developing deep empathy for that problem your client is trying to navigate and trying to solve. And, 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 creating everything you're doing, creating your entire business model and your service delivery model uh, in a way that is centered around the client's needs. So the message of the book at a high level, you know, is, is like, hey, let's tear up the way that legal services have been delivered for generations now and, and rethink it from the ground up and rethink it from the ground up in a way that helps us not only deliver better legal services to the 23% of consumers that are having their needs serviced by lawyers today, because we can do better there. But it's not a zero sum game either. It's not just how do you apply this thinking to go win a larger chunk of that 23% market? How do you apply this thinking to go tap into this vast, what I describe as the, the latent legal market, the 77% of legal issues that go unaddressed by lawyers? And if we can, we can do that, um, it's actually a trillion dollar opportunity. The you know, legal spend in the US is $437 billion per year. And that is the 23% slice that is above the waterline, so to speak. Do the math, you know, we've got a market opportunity that is four times larger uh, if we figure out how to tap into this latent legal market. Um, and, and sure, things will need to be priced and packaged differently to tackle that market. But it is without question a multi-hundred billion dollar opportunity to grow legal uh, to be bigger and higher impact than it, is, uh, than it is today. So the reason I say the book is actually more relevant than ever, you know, amidst the pandemic and, and post-pandemic is the rule book kind of got torn up for us. It, it's no longer, hey, hey, go disrupt this way you were doing business and try this new thing, which is like obviously a, a much bigger lift. Your business has already been disrupted. We're already in a new world. You're gonna need to rebuild, uh, you know, anyhow, you know, let's, let's, let's build back better. You know, let's, let's apply this client-centered thinking to the way that we are designing and delivering legal services going forward. And, and the book provides you a blueprint for how to, how to rethink the way that you're delivering legal services. And, and really, you know, the book is a distillation of my decade plus in legal, working with, with thousands of, of law firms, working with some of the, the best run law firms in, in the world and extracting what helped them really stand apart from the crowd. And, and the common thread I saw in virtually all of the law firms I was working with that were these really high performance law firms um, was what I, I started to recognize as this very client centered DNA and how they thought about their services, how they thought about their, their offering. And I'll, I'll conclude on that note, maybe highlighting one important distinction and being client centered versus client first. And this is a, a mistake a lot of people uh, make understandably is thinking that being client centered means putting your clients first, but it, it's really not about that. And, and the reason I don't like the frame of saying you're putting your clients first is that it, it obviously implies that something else is coming second, third and fourth. And that might be your own livelihood, that might be your own quality of life, that might be your staff's quality of life. And the reality is that when you're being truly client centered, 
Um, and, and again, these can be deploying things that are really tactical, like accepting credit card payments, uh, developing a client portal, uh, uh, taking subscriptions from your customers rather than upfront payments or billable hour payments. These are all things that can actually be a huge win, win, win for you and your clients and at a macro level for access to justice. And that's, I think, the really exciting opportunity that, that client-centered thinking presents, which is to develop a, a model for your law firm that will make your clients happier and actually make you more profitable and more successful. Uh, and when we're really executing at a high level, we're actually making our legal services more accessible, more affordable and more consumable and increasing access to justice as a, as a side effect. I love how we ended up here, right? And we were talking before about um, how basically, I would say 12 years ago, right? Since, since you started Clio, um, but even, even just over the pandemic that we've seen such a change in how lawyers are trying to meet the expectations of their clients. And it is really true that a lot of these methodologies that were being deployed were really outdated and really didn't, didn't honestly meet the needs of the consumer. Um, but I sort of, I see this everywhere, right? And, and I think that that's why Clio is so cool is because you guys were really the first to take this, this sort of um, client centric, right? To, to yep. steal the name of your book for a second, client centric approach and really deploy it for law firms. Um, because I'll, I'll give you the, the most pertinent, in a pertinent example for me. And I, I like to like use other examples to, to kind of give a, give a good, like analogy for how things work. It's sort of how I understand things. Um, and uh, like today, I have the bug people come into my house. They're going to spray some natural crazy pesticides on my lawn. It's safe for my dog. It's safe for kids. I don't have any kids. But if I had kids, it would be safe for them. Um, and I got a text message from them confirming that they were coming. Uh, they said, in this text message, you can reply to this with any special requests of where you would like us to go and, you know, clean with like the brush or whatever. Um, here's your bill. Uh, this is the online payment portal that you can go in and change your credit card and manage your, this is for bug spray. They come like three times a year to my house. I have a portal. I have text messaging services. They have an app. They email market me. Do you need anything? Right. Yeah. They have this whole, I don't even, it's like a, it's an entire corporation of people who are just making sure that like, I don't get bit by a bunch of mosquitoes in my backyard. Um, yeah. And no, it's, it's, it's huge. And, and, you know, it, it, it's a great example, you know, and, and again, the, the kind of bizarre reality is that your, your local pest control people have better technology than the average law firm out there, right? Like if you went to go get, uh, you know, some high stakes legal matter pursued, you're going to see less, uh, less in the way of updates, text messaging, technology savviness from, you know, from the average law firm than you would from your, your, your pest control company. And I'll give you another example, just from a, you know, another, another space, uh, you know, a friend of mine recently, went through the process of selecting a new dentist. And, you know, again, you know, to our comment previously about, you know, how consumers will select professionals they work with, you know, he, he looked at dentists as pretty much a, a fungible commodity. I mean, they're all gonna clean my teeth. They're all gonna do kind of about the same job, which like it or not is the way that a lot of consumers look at legal services that, that they're getting. And, and what he prioritized in his selection process was, do they allow for online appointment setting? And do they have you know, mobile connectivity where he can confirm appointments by text message and change them by text message? And, and the long and short of it being, he never wanted to receive a phone call from his dentist office. He never wanted to have one of those, your appointments overdue, can we schedule you and, and doing that calendar tag uh, kind of process. And that was his sole criteria, you know? So some, somebody, some dentist won his, de his, his business forever just by differentiating on the technology. And this is another important point I make in the book, which is as a lawyer, you've done the hard work. You've gone to law school. 
you, you've, you've gotten uh, a law degree, you've, you've passed the bar exam, you've accomplished something uh, a vanishingly small portion of human beings ever accomplish in their, in their lives. The easy work is actually, you know, thinking about how you differentiate the great legal product you'll deliver by wrapping it in this effortless experience and wrapping it in this client centered experience. And that's a really, really straightforward and easy way for you to drive massive differentiation in the marketplace. Uh, and, and it's, it's something that every lawyer can do with a re relatively small amount of, uh, of effort. And, you know, m maybe one of the points I'll, I'll, I'll conclude on, cause I, I know we're, we're running out of time here, but you know, I, I talked about this concept called the aggregation of marginal gains earlier. And it's, it's another concept I, I, I talked about at the, my, my keynote at ClioCon this year. And it's this concept that, that Dave Brailsford, who is the performance coach for the British cycling team uh, in the early 2000s introduced. And he came to the British cycling team uh, at a time they were the losingest team in all of cycling and, and actually considered probably one of the worst sports enterprises in, in any field uh, outside of cycling. And they were so bad that even equipment manufacturers didn't want them to use their equipment because it, it, it would reflect poorly on their brand. So this team was in the doldrums. And, you know, Dave brought this this aggregation of marginal gains concept to bear on the British cycling team. And his concept was simple. It was, let's find ways to drive 1% improvements in everything we do from the, the clothes we, we wear and the performance of our, our gear to our sleep schedules to, you know, everything around um, our, our diet, our, our overall routine, our training regimen. And he found ways, you know, hundreds of ways of driving these 1% gains. And, and, and the key idea here is that those 1% gains compound on one another. If you find a way to get 1% better at something every day, and you do that for 365 days, the, the math of compounding is amazing. You actually end up 37 times better at that thing at the end of a year. Not 37%, by the way, 37 times better at that thing at the end of a year than you were when you started. And you know, the takeaway message I, I, I like to leave people when they're, they're thinking about this, what seems like a huge lift, you know, how do I go and become cloud-based and how to become client-centered and how do I do all these things? It feels like I'm trying to boil the ocean. It, the, the key idea is don't get overwhelmed. Think of ways that you can implement these changes in a really progressive, iterative way. You can do it a piece at a time, day by day, drive those 1% changes every day, those 1% improvements, and you will be radically transformed over the course of, you know, just weeks and months, and, and certainly over the course of, of years. And that's the kind of process that can drive really profound change, but in an iterative way. I think if that's the number one takeaway that you get as a lawyer watching this show is that if you can try to do one thing every day to improve your firm, to improve the way that you interact with your customers, to improve the way that you deliver your services, you might not even do it for 365 days, right? But the math of compounding is that you will get at some point like twice as good. And if you continue to be open-minded and, and meet your consumers where they are, I mean, the possibilities are really endless. We're seeing growth every single year. And, uh, and, and while you were talking about like, uh, you know, there's like a, what did you, what did you call it? A $1 trillion opportunity out there. I was, trillion like, dollar opportunity, yeah. I was like, okay, like this, this industry is not dying. I'm going to have a job. I won't have to write up my resume. Like I can stay here. I'm just kidding. No, anyway. it's, it, yeah. no, it's a, but, but yeah, it, it's, you know, what's so interesting though. And, and you know, I, I talked to so many lawyers that think about the legal space in this, this kind of zero sum game kind of way and, and think about it, you know, in terms of battling other lawyers for that 23% of the market that's, that's above the waterline. And if I win this client, it means you lose this client. And, you know, when we, when we talk about the commodification of legal services, we talk about the, the, 
the limited size of the market, it's very much with that, that, that zero sum game uh, kind of perspective. But when you, you realize this is actually an infinite game, you realize that there's actually uh, a huge latent legal market and, and probably a market, by the way, that is even larger than, than we, we, we could ever believe that's available to lawyers that, uh, that are innovative in tapping into the, the, these modern consumers with, with modern needs and, and changing the way they do business. That is a really simple way of differentiating yourself and positioning yourself for, for growth. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an entrepreneurial opportunity. If you, if you put on your entrepreneur hat and think about how to build that mark, product market fit, uh, if you pick up my, my book and apply these, these concepts of being a client-centered lawyer, you're, you're going to be in a, in a position to really thrive over, uh, over the next few years and beyond. I think the last thing, because I think that's like the most perfect place to end, right, is uh, I was talking to Jared Correa. I'm sure you know Jared. I know uh, Jared well, yeah. Yeah, Jared's a great guy. Uh, he is. We, we had an episode of the podcast where we were talking about this sort of thing that he was recommending to uh, his clients. And we were like, doesn't this all cost like a couple of dollars a month? Like everything that we just discussed in the last hour and 10 minutes is not a big investment at all. So no, <laughs> no, that, I mean, I it's, to, yeah, it's yeah, pennies on, very, on the dollar that you're going to make. That's right. So it's, it's a no brainer. Uh, Jack, I want to thank you so much. I hope I didn't take up too much of your time. No, um, really, really enjoyed our conversation, Nick. Thanks for having me. Me too. Uh, in the description, I'm going to put a link to the Clio website, which you should all go check out. I'm going to put a link to Jack's book. And what was the last thing? Oh, I'm going to put a link to the Clio Legal Trends Report for 2020 and probably 2019 too. Go check all that stuff out if you want to get really good at catering to your clients and pick up a larger market share. Jack, thank you again. Thank you, Nick.